do the Hitman, Borderlands, and earlier Assassin's Creed games have in common? Besides being fantastically fun, yet violent games, their scores were composed by Jasper Kidd. I've been giving a lot of creative freedom on the Assassin's games, and it really allows us to create something as unique as the Assassin's games are. The Danish composer beautifully crafts emotional yet ominous musical pieces that fit the atmosphere of his games perfectly. Using both acoustic and electronic elements, as well as an orchestra and choir, Kid gets your heart pumping as you're about to assassinate someone as Agent 47, about to assassinate someone else as a member of the Creed, or just murder a whole bunch of psychos as a vault hunter. <laughs> Kid also composed the soundtrack for the vastly underrated Darksiders 2. Jesper Kuhn from Budapest. Og øh, vi optager musikken til Hitman 2. Jesper er 29 år og bor på Manhattan i New York. Han er oprindeligt fra Hørsholm nord for København og var i 80'erne en væsentlig person på Amiga demo scenen. Jeg var i demogruppe med Valle og vi var kvind Valle. En demo er en slags lille musikvideo, der demonstrerer hvor meget man kan få ud af sin computer. Jesper og Mikaels demogruppe hedder Silence, og rollefordelingen er klar. Jesper laver musikken og Mikael grafikken. Sammen er de blandt de bedste i Europa. I starten af 90'erne slog de så sammen med en anden demogruppe, nemlig Cryonix. De flytter alle sammen ind i en lejlighed i København og begynder at arbejde på deres første computerspil. Inden spillet er helt færdigt, bliver gruppen kontaktet af et amerikansk computerspilsforlag, der inviterer dem til Boston. Så producerede Sega så titlen, så afsluttede den, og kom, så kom den ud. Og det blev sådan en rimelig godt måde, så så er vi på vej. Jesper, Michael og Cryonix bosætter sig i Boston og producerer en masse computerspil. Men da firmaet går ned, tager Michael Baller og de andre hjem til Danmark, hvor de er med til at starte firmaet IO Interactive. Der går de i gang med at lave den første seriøse spilsatsning på dansk jord, Hitman Codename 47. Jesper bliver i USA og tager til New York, men bliver hurtigt involveret i musikken til Hitman. De folk har jo kendt længe, altså. Og øh, vi snakker om, om, om de spil, og vi snakker om det rimelig tidligt, så jeg har god tid til at forberede mig. Hitman Codename 47 bliver en stor succes over hele verden, og IO Interactive går hurtigt i gang med at lave en efterfølger. Jesper bliver igen involveret, og sammen bliver de enige om at lave et stort orkester-soundtrack, som man kender det fra filmens verden. Man sidder ikke og regner med, at der er et kæmpe vildt soundtrack til det her spil, man har købt. Man sidder og regner med, at det bliver nok sådan lidt uh, halvkendelig musik, som er, som er sådan substandard til filmsoundtracks. Altså, jeg vil da nok regne med, at det kommer op på en højere standard her. Indspilningen foregår i Ungarn, hvor det er billigere at hyre et stort symfoniorkester, end det er i New York eller i Danmark. Næsten ingen af musikerne taler engelsk, og de færreste af dem ved, hvad musikken skal bruges til. Nu er det sådan... Øh og høre, hvordan det, hvor, hvor tæt det egentlig lyder på det, vi havde planlagt. Og hvordan alle de idéer, som vi havde planlagt, de er efterhånden øh, er kommet ind i musikken. Nice to be uh, both a gamer and a musician, and then to be able to experience them both at the same time. A lot of us, you know, reminisce over this stuff, and it's kind of, you know, it touches you in your heart to, to hear this kind of stuff being performed by musicians. They're an incredibly powerful experience in that they are this amalgam of all these different art forms uh, you know you have you have you know, sculpture and 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 drawing and script writing if if that's applicable and and music and all of these different thing all these different art forms are are combined into something that's greater than the sum of its parts and the fact that music is is part of that experience means that when you play those games that music becomes part of your life experience because you, you sort of live through the games 
while you're playing them. The Crusader genre in general is amongst my favorite to work on, mostly because it allows me to explore a lot of exotic instruments and mysterious sounds that uh, I don't often get the opportunity to play with. As far as the music goes, I'll pretty much be sticking with the same formula as I did for Crusader 1, which was a combination of sampled instruments alongside live players. And while the latest technology is getting better and better and, and sounds fantastic, I can tell you that uh, nothing compares and probably will ever compare with the real thing. It's also a great excuse to get together with some super talented musicians who play all these various uh, eccentric instruments. And while I am the composer and arranger, uh, these other players really deserve a lot of the credit for helping create the atmospheres you'll be hearing. Anyhow, I figured I'd give everyone a small glimpse into what goes behind creating the sound for Firefly. I believe every studio should have a giant wall of beer cans in it. And over here is arguably the greatest sound effects prop ever invented. I'll bet that guy's pretty rich. My favorite tax write-off. This big area is what is referred to as a live room, and basically I use this space to record ensembles, large groups of people, uh, certain instruments sound better recorded in a larger space, and I also do a lot of sound effects recording here. And then we have... The Door. Okay, we're in the control room now. And this is the isolation booth, and all kinds of fun stuff happens behind that glass. Meet the coolest action figure of all time. Lots of buttons and knobs and lights. Not sure what most do, but they look cool. Oh, relax, little buddy. And that's about it. Oh, and here's the original mandolin used on the very first stronghold. seem innocent enough. It's a double reed instrument. Um, in the orchestra you have uh, descendants of this and some other things. Double reeds in the orchestra are uh, the oboe or the English horn and the bassoon. And I think it's one of the loveliest, sweetest sounds in the world. But it's got holes instead of keys, so you can do all kinds of shading. <laughs> just like you might in the blues.
Look at those socks. Oh, God. Here's a quick demo of a technique known as key switching. Key switching allows a composer to squeeze a lot more expression out of his sampled instruments, and it works like this. Each of the blue keys on the left side of the keyboard represents different articulations, or playing styles, of a particular instrument. If I press one of these keys, it makes no sound, but it instantly remaps the entire keyboard with a new set of samples. So, for example, on this flute sound, hitting the low D sharp will map the keys to play samples that have no vibrato. Hitting the low C will bring in an entirely different set of samples that do have vibrato. And other switches offer additional nuances that this instrument might make in the hands of a real player. So as I play different key switches with my left hand, while the right hand plays my melody, I can create much more interesting and believable lines. Musical score and sound effects in Age of Mythology are the original creations of Ensemble Studios' sound and music department. In the past, we've relied heavily on synthesizers and keyboards, but for this game, we really wanted to have an organic feel, and uh, the way we tried to achieve that was bringing in more live instruments into the music and getting a real natural feel to it. For portions of the musical score, Stephen Rippey and Kevin McMullen were required to stretch their musical wings and compose for a full 70-piece orchestra and choir. Working with a live orchestra was something that we'd wanted for a long time but never really had the opportunity to do. And when it came up for Age of Mythology, we were really excited about it, but we were also pretty nervous. We weren't sure if we'd be able to pull it off. The orchestra was truly amazing. Working with them was a completely new experience for us. We really had to just go full throttle and see what happened. And with the people we were working with, everything turned out better than we could have imagined. When it came to sound effects design, the sound team made the decision to create the majority of the sound effects from scratch rather than using their existing libraries. We feel like it's important to build up a large bank of sounds that we can use in the game. And to do that, we have to pull sounds from everywhere. Um, whether that means getting people out of their offices to go stomp around in the parking lot, or going to the grocery store and finding vegetables to smash, or taking our sound equipment down to the zoo to record the animals there. And sometimes the stuff that we get winds up being used in the weirdest places. Uh, for example, a room full of penguins turned into the sound of souls being tortured in the underworld. Once we have a sound, uh, we go to put it in the game. For example, uh, on an animation of a unit, we'll open up the animation and plug in the sounds to match its movements. It never ceases to amaze me the life that comes to that unit when you add the sound. And then when you have several units on screen in the game, it really becomes a living world. Recently, we had the chance to record a full orchestra for some of the music in Asian mythology. We'd like to walk you through some of the steps that it takes to get from an idea to a finished product. The first part of the process was to create a mock-up of the finished music. Keyboards and samplers were used to simulate the orchestra that would later re-record the tracks. The demos were sent to an orchestrator named Stan Lepard. His job on the project was to translate our ideas into written music for the performers in the orchestra and choir. Once this phase of the process was completed, we flew to Seattle to attend the session. After a day of recording and a day of mixing, the music was finished. What follows are a couple of examples of some of the specific points that we wanted to address with these tracks. It's been really important to us to give the game a strong, identifiable main theme. There's so many movies that are instantly recognizable just by hearing the first few notes, and we wanted to have that same kind of effect. One way to do that is to keep things simple. And so to keep things simple for Age of Mythology, I started with just one instrument. I came to work one morning with a pretty vague idea of what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted a melody that was simple and hummable, and I also knew that I would have time to fill in a lot of the gaps later. So I started with just a simple piano sound and came up with this.
once I had the melody worked out, I was able to build up the rest of the parts where it was something closer to what the orchestra will actually play when it's recorded. This is an important piece of music for us because it gets used in so many ways. Not only does it appear at the beginning of the game, but it also gets attached to things like this marketing trailer. And the trick there is to make sure that the music matches up with the visuals. This song is the one you hear when you lose the game. With this piece, I wanted to try something different and focus more on dynamics and emotion as opposed to melody. To do that, I uh, experimented with the effects that the orchestra and the choir could produce. One of the effects I wanted to try with the choir was have them whisper two Greek words, Thanatos and Dialusis, starting out with two voices on either side of the stereo field and adding more and more voices to the end of the song. For the demo, uh, to get this effect, I had Stephen Rippey and Chris Rippey help me out and record the whispering themselves and added it to the track. It sounds something like this. Also, I wanted to have the horns blow through their instruments and finger notes without actually making a pitch. I think it'll work. It sounds it sounds better than the demo. It does. It does. Jeremy Sewell. I really want the entire gamut of the experience of, of the music to reflect the real world, not just the virtual world. Synonymous with Western RPGs is Jeremy Sewell, the man behind the music in the Elder Scrolls and Guild Wars series. Sewell started his career off in Square joined Humongous Entertainment and eventually formed his own musical production company, Artistry Entertainment, with which he has found his greatest successes. He mixes various styles of music, including orchestral arrangements and tribal influences. Soul has won multiple awards has a BAFTA nomination to his credit, and, most prestigious of all, has been called the John Williams of video games for his epic soundtracks. Now, that's a compliment. I'm very happy to say we've got Jeremy Soul back at the helm uh, doing the music for the game. Todd actually spoke to him first, I think, about, well, what we have in mind is this kind of heavy-handed, brutal sound that, you know, it's the land of the Nords and Skyrim, so we don't want it to be 
as melodic or flowing as it was before. And I've got this great idea for a Viking choir, a big choir of hundreds of Vikings that, you know, that we want to have sing this made up language. <laughs> First things first, he went off and started with the theme and then would send me little bits. And it really wasn't that long, actually, until he had pretty much what you hear now. But for the most part, it is rooted on the Elder Scrolls theme that people kind of know and love at this point, which first premiered in Morrowind. The big drum intro is kind of the common element that we wanted to incorporate this time as well. So that main melody is there. The chords behind it have changed. It's almost like a different arrangement. And uh, except with bigger drums, uh, huge colossal drums. A lot of the times the, the only notes I'll send him are just more of the drums. You know, we like the big deep drums and the horns. That sounds like, that sounds like Skyrim. For probably two years now, I think we've had the main theme. But it was only this year that we finally got to put the real choir to it. I mean, we've heard it hundreds of times now. You feel like you're going to get really sick of something, and it does get stuck in your head and all that sort of thing. But once the choir went on there, you know, there are these certain parts when they come to the main Elder Scrolls theme about two thirds of the way through. And you still, after hearing it this many times, you still get the goosebumps in the back of your neck. made up of a massive, uh, well, it was actually 30 people recorded <laughs> multiple times, but it sounds, uh, there's the choir by itself, it's like this. I'm really excited for fans to hear it for the first time. You know, we know it backwards and forwards now, but no one else has heard it, they haven't heard the lyrics that are in it or translated it to figure out what it means yet or if they'll be able to, uh, I guess we'll wait and see. So any questions on the pronunciation? Let's try it. I had this idea that the music for Skyrim would be the Elder Scrolls theme, but sung by a barbarian choir. So I called Jeremy Soule, who does our music. I mean, this is in 2006. Jeremy, I hear the Elder Scrolls theme as sung by a barbarian choir. Okay, how are we gonna do that? I don't know. You know, what are they singing? They're singing this song in the dragon language to the theme of Elder Scrolls. Or do you want a solid break right here? Um, let's, let's, let's go ahead and carry it. His work on the main theme of the game set the tone for the rest of it. And eventually we went to, uh, out to Los Angeles to Sony's scoring stage and then had just a fantastic choir and choir director. Settle. And the choir was only made up of about 30 people. director would kind of whip them up into more of a frenzy, emphasizing this Nordic feel the whole time. So they're dun, da dun, dun, da dun, dun, da dun, 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 dun,
really pound on every downbeat. And what they would do is just do three passes on each verse of the song. Now you've got the sound of 90 people singing this thing in this massive hall. You take a break from it and you come back, you still get the hairs raising on your neck every time they come to the big chorus. Because you're, you're a composer by trade, right? Like, yeah. w do you f discover music and that love before you ever discover video games? No, I, well, I mean, I discovered video games, but it was, you know, probably a few years in when, when Final Fantasy II came out. And then sure. that's when I started discovering my love of video game music. I mean, even going back to like Super Mario Brothers 2, uh, I was just like, oh, it's so awesome that when you go into the little, the little mirrored world yeah. uh, with the little dark thing and it plays like the original Mario theme, like I used to take my little tape recorder and put it up next to the speaker and record it because there was just no other way to listen to it other than to get to that part. Make your own time. really bad rips. <laughs> and and I uh, I used to rent Super Nintendo games and record. Like a lot of them had sound tests then. And I would just record them to cassette tapes sure. and just listen to them whenever. Like while doing other things. So then, so do, would you say your love of music was your first passion? Like that's what I'm saying. Like did you find video games first or music first? I would say I found music first because yeah. uh, I I started my parents had a piano that no one really played and I just sort of started banging around on it and eventually I took lessons. Uh, my dad listened to a lot of classical music and Vangelis music. So like those were the things I sort of heard early influences, in life yeah, yeah. and those are still influences now. But, uh, you know, at the time when, when I finally started to write, to write music in, in, I don't know, freshman year, sophomore year of high school. Yeah. You know, most most of the games I was interested in were coming from Japan. So just like the idea of being a professional video game composer was not was not really something that seemed like plausible. that you could do or yeah. even plausible. It's like, oh, you have to live in Japan and be Japanese and work for these companies to do. Can I speak with uh, Jerry Martin, please? Yeah, right here. Hey, Jerry, this is uh, Robert Payne. Hey, Robert, how are you doing? That, of course, is Jerry Martin. Not only the soundtrack composer for SimCity 3000, but SimCity 4 and all of the Sims and the Sim expansions. And he was gracious to give us a interview for this podcast. The soundtrack is so unique, it covers so many styles. I was curious to see what kind of direction creator Will Wright gave Jerry Martin in the soundtrack. On SimCity 3000, there wasn't much direction. If, mm -hmm. I don't really call. I don't really recall. It's really hard to believe that there's zero direction, but that's it actually was the case. It's kind of up to me to figure that out. And I know they had done, in SimCity 2000, I kind of came on board after they had done that. And they had some kind of jazz oriented stuff to it and so I, I figured that um, well, I, I kind of wanted to do like three styles there's three basic genres in there mm -hmm. 
there's the um, jazz, and and these these are all kind of the, the jazz, and there's kind of a Gershwin. There's only a couple of tunes with the Gershwin-ish style yeah, in there. I can definitely tell that. Yeah, the the main theme, and then there's another one called um, Sim Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are really the only two Gershwin-ish things in there. Um, and then there's kind of some hints of that a little bit here and there, some of the minimal stuff. But that was to, that was the idea was that that would kind of bring out the city feel, you know, the feel of the city. And same with the jazz, that's designed to bring out the, the feel of the city. One of the things that really draws me to the soundtrack is its use of jazz, and its use of really traditional jazz. Uh, you know, when I think of the song uh, Nightlife or uptown downtown that's off the soundtrack it reminds me of some of the uh great jazz standards such as like milestones or or lee morgan's sidewinder it almost reminded me of miles davis's kind of blue and this soundtrack this is no joke kind of jazz this is great themes great playing great improvisation and when i heard this this for the first time i thought it this might be miles davis they were john coltrane uh but uh Indeed, uh, Jerry Martin was the person that composed it. Well, I've always been a big Miles fan. Again, Jerry Martin. So, I mean, if anything sounds like him, that's definitely a plus for me. Um, yeah, but you know, I mean, his older stuff, actually, um, when I was thinking, I was thinking of Green Haze. You ever heard that? His album? Green, ha- Green Haze? At this point, I'm writing down green haze miles davis listened to it and sure enough after i got off this interview that album is exactly how this soundtrack is is what inspired this jazz starts it kind of blue and then works up yeah so, you know like most people yeah I, guess. I think it was a little bit before kind of blue but it's kind of it's pretty it's pretty close to that style it's a little more bop maybe but uh, kind of blue is, is very you know that's actually pretty close to some of the stuff I wanted to do <laughs> kind of hard to be that good but. well it definitely comes across though I mean and I think it comes across more than most that's why I, I think the soundtrack is so unique is that when you hear it you go that really sounds like real people playing yeah well that's i mean that's the key for me is to to get really great players i've got a a guy that i use for trumpet is eddie ramirez he's he's so good you know he can just pretty much sound you know like miles Mm -hmm. and um, also mark russo who also wrote some of the songs is an amazing sax player so that yeah, you know, that really helps. And it just helps to have all the really good, good people to play. This is a song called Central Park Sunday by Mark Russo, actually. And at the time, were these are these guys just your your friends at the time? Did you know Did you know them before you? you uh... Yeah, well, I, I had worked with them before on, in musical projects and stuff. Yeah, they're friends. So that, yeah, that, that actually takes my so the, the Central Park Sunday and the, so you wrote the, as far as as far as the jazz you wrote nightlife up downtown. Yeah. And then Mark Russo he wrote uh, Central Park Sunday. Right. Mark Mark wrote Central Park Sunday and I think Kirk wrote Southbridge. Mm-hmm. 
But like Mark is, is an amazing sax player. He's all, kind of all over, all over that soundtrack. And any, any time you hear sax, it's Mark. Mm -hmm. Jerry mentioned that several of the tracks have distinctly Gershwin influences, and what he means by that, he's referring to George and Ira Gershwin, who were very, very famous composers in the mid-1920s in New York, and a lot of their songs and their compositions really embody the idea of city life, big city life. That's the most apparent in the track Sim Broadway. Now, when you, I mean, it, when you start talking jazz, I mean, a, a lot of jazz is improv. So, how much leeway did you give them improv-wise? How much did you give them compositionally? Um, pretty much standard method of jazz stuff, where you write out a little melody, head, and then the chords, and then um, you know maybe a little bit of direction as far as speed and feel of it. Kind of let them go. Oh, it's the cool thing about using really great people is it makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> it absolutely does. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, th those I think you know that's what's so great. But you know, um, as you said, you know the uh, you know the jazz and the Gershwin they really give um, they give this like a city feel. They give the New York feel or you know the Chicago feel. It's that yeah. that's what you know our it's what we're used to hearing when you see cinematic city stuff from right. you know period pieces. Yeah, and it's hard to get around that. You know, it's just part of our culture, and so you know you can't really fight it. That's the feel that you get when you hear that. So what I wanted to do. The Gershwin stuff isn't, there's a little bit of improv in there, but it's mostly written out stuff. Now, when you hear, sometimes it sounds like clarinet that's in there. What is it? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's clarinet. That's a, a, a girl named Mary. Um, she's a really pretty amazing clarinet player, and she also doubles on flute. So there's a couple of tunes in there that I, I don't know if she played flute on that. She, she did in The Sims, where she played both clarinet and flute. So. Yeah, no, there's definitely flute in there, too. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's back in the back at some point, but... Um, yeah. yeah, there's a couple. I think I used her on some of the middle of it. I kind of forgot that. Right. So yeah, there's clarinet and flute, and then there's also, like you mentioned, there's the violin. Uh, Daryl Anger, mm -hmm. who's a really great violin player. He's uh, playing in there. Jerry Martin was pretty specific about the different musical styles that were on the soundtrack. There, of course, is the jazz, and then there's the Gershwin take on the jazz. Uh, but then, in stark contrast, there is an electronic or electronica style of music on the soundtrack, and it is such a distinct shift from what was going on. In the jazz, of course, you have live musicians, you have acoustic instruments you have a really different um live human interaction and then a massive shift to the electronic music which is all computer generated computer keyboard uh instruments and so this is a brilliant juxtaposition where sometimes in the city it is beautiful and everything is feels good you feel like it's 
moving like jazz, a lot of parts that are moving that, that are creating beautiful music, but then there's another part of the city that's systematic, that's devalued of human feel or uh, human um, creative touch. And then the other style is this uh, kind of electronica, um, and that is designed to um, well, it's kind of like a combination of minimalism and like there, there, there are actually maybe four styles if you can sure, well, minimalism. Uh, so when you talk minimalism, so are you uh, kind of thinking more like like Philip Glass or Stephen Reich? What? Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, patternistic minimalism, where it's pattern pattern oriented. Or, and then, 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 then the electronica is just is kind of actually the the pattern oriented minimalism stuff, which is actually a lot of this stuff in the game is that genre. Um, that is designed to bring out the feel of tinkering on your city, mm-hmm. sort of just kind of like messing around with it and having it slowly develop. Um, and then the the electronica is kind of designed to bring out the, um, the feel of, of just the um, physical part of your city. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe dark alleys and stuff like that, kind of a little bit darker. Sure, absolutely. The, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, I think one of the, uh, most interesting thing is about the soundtrack is that how the soundtrack develops as the city develops um, and I was just curious uh, how you kind of came how you approach that creatively kind of touched on that a little bit but maybe you can expound on that well it really doesn't it, there's no interactive element to it so it, it's just it's kind of just has those four genres in it and they're they kind of randomly play um so right. So so they really aren't they really aren't uh, timed. So when your city grows, the no no. The, the thing about it is they are so long. You know the people play the the game for so long that I wanted to do really long pieces. So I don't think there's a piece under six minutes and whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're all around six minutes and not. Throughout this conversation with Jerry, I couldn't help to be struck by the fact that how much musical styles and musical influences that we both shared and both had in common. We both love jazz, we both love Gershwin, we both love electronica, we both uh, love uh, minimalist pattern style music. In fact, in college I majored in minimalist composition and so there's no wonder I really resonated with the soundtrack. It is a culmination of all these styles that I love and I just didn't realize that before this conversation. The um, you know and then you you kind of uh, alluded to the fact that you um, uh, did some more pattern based or minimalist uh, numbers on there and um, mm-hmm. Uh, just out of curiosity, you know what? Who, who are the? You know, we mentioned Philip Glass and Stephen Reich, but who, who are, you know, would you say is a big influence on that? Um, well, my big influence is Terry Riley because yeah. I, I went to school and studied with him at Mills College, and he's um, he pretty much started that whole fad back in the '60s. But then Steve Wright kind of took off on it and also filled glass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to see if you were going to say John Adams in there too. Yeah, not really. The John, I know John Adams does a lot of that uh, orchest- orchestral stuff where it's patternistic. Well, but, so uh, for some of that pattern stuff, like what, you know, this is, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's not terribly long ago that the soundtrack came out, but what kind of gear were you using back then to get some of that synth and pattern stuff? Um, well, actually, a lot of it is acoustic. Like the um, there's one song in there that turn, I think turned out really nice. Is it's called Magic City. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty mostly is in the inside of a piano, where I had um, I was kind of pounding on the strings with a pencil. 
Mm -hmm, a little prepared piano almost? Yeah, sort of, but I mean, it's just like a pencil, the side, you know, the eraser side with a little metal cap. Absolutely. And it sounded great. <laughs> and then, um, so I had a couple little, you know, scrapes and stuff on that, on the inside of the piano on the right notes. And um, so I tried to use acoustic stuff quite a bit. Um, then there's some other tunes in there with guitar, just guitar and uh, maracas and just, you know, little acoustic instruments. And then that's mixed with synthesizer mm -hmm. stuff. But nothing special as far as the synthesizers were just kind of standard. Um, a lot of Roland and Korg. Mm. So nothing really off the wall, just just kind of your standard stuff. Your, I mean, your, it, it, is it is it uh, suffice to say is it um, that you were really going for more acoustic than you were synth synth synthetic sounds on this then? Um. I think on the the minimalist stuff, it is a little more acoustic, and then the well, I can't really say that. I mean, it is pretty much of a blend, so it's it's pretty half and half actually. And then the electronica is all electronic. It's only a couple of songs that we classify that way, though. Right, right. Well, so you know, so the, so the soundtrack, the game does very well. Um, and you know it really puts a lot of people on the map uh, creative wise and game wise because it's um, uh, so what was the biggest surprise for you when the game released you know what 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 kind of was a big moment for you when the game came out well I guess it was a good moment for me because I mean I got a lot of nice reviews about the music and the sound and so that was and I had done a lot of, you know, a lot of work on it. I took a lot of, you know, care with the music. So it well, was pretty rewarding as far as the reception was pretty good. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I mean, a lot of critical critical success leads you on to do some other stuff too. So, um, you what what since since that soundtrack's come out, uh, I kind I kind of know what you've gone on to do, but. Uh, um, what uh, what what are some of the bigger projects that that soundtrack led into? And uh... well, the next versions of Sin City, uh, which was Sin City. Well, they did a, like a smaller ver, uh, like a, a unlimited version, which really only added a couple of things. And then Sin City Four, and then Sin City Four Rush Hour. So with those, I, I kind of just wanted to expand that, uh, what I had done in Sin City 3000. Mm -hmm. And so in Sin City 4, Rush Hour, I used some orchestra, um, also in a minimalist way. Though. Yeah, you can definitely tell the evolution between the two. Yeah, yeah, it kind of adds, you know, adds. It, it, it's, I wanted to add stuff that wasn't in there, you know, in Sin City 3000, and then sort of expand on what was there. Well, that's cool, man. I, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time again. Um, I know how busy you got stuff going, and, uh, um, I, you know, is there anything that you kind of want to leave, leave, leave it with? Uh, any kind of final thoughts about the soundtrack and... Um, I don't know. Uh, we covered everything. I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm glad you're interested in it. I'm, I'm really happy about it as far as, uh, you know, my work. It, I, like I said before, I, it's one of my favorites. It turned out really good, and that's about it. Well, that's good. It's, uh, um, it's good talking to you, man. I really appreciate it, and uh, um, you taking the time to do this. And uh, yeah, well, I appreciate your. Uh...